right, all right. Before we start, why don't we first do it? This is the state of the nation. Ibifa Mwanga. We are deliberate. We are reasonable. We are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Sal. All right, all right. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Henry Sally, and this is the state of the nation. Uh, before we start. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto African Alumni Association operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendent, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across the Tato Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Henry Sally. Uh, we are still interrogating uh, the same question. Is Uganda ripe for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? Now, many of you might be asking themselves, what does he mean uh, when he talks about a Truth and Reconciliation? Usually, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions happen because of challenging histories within a certain country. In the context of Uganda, uh, we feel like it's about time for us to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, beyond the liberation. Many of you know about uh, the 1980, 1985, 86. Uh, liberation war uh, that brought the NRM into government. After over 36 years, many things have happened. There has been a, a, a conundrum of peace, instability, even when they talk about stability a lot. Uh, but also injustices uh, amongst certain sections of the population uh, to the extent that now uh, when certain people pass, uh, there are some sections of Ugandans who celebrate. Instead of coming together as a, a people, a country, uh, and mourn together and celebrate uh, the, the people, the, the elders, uh, the liberators, and some of us are thinking that perhaps we need to have some sort of conversation, conversation that is uh, supposed to be a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, uh, one that is going to speak uh, to some of the challenges that have happened in the, in the past uh, and see how we can uh, move forward uh, with our challenges. Now, today I have uh, three distinguished uh, panelists that are going to engage in this conversation, including uh, our very own Mr. Julius uh, Mitala, uh, who many of you already know, who is with us here in the studio today. Uh, the other two panelists are still uh, trying to get into the studio. Of course, they are in Uganda. Uh, we think that this conversation is vital. Uh, but most importantly, we think that this conversation should happen uh, with our brothers and sisters uh, in Uganda. So we try to give them an opportunity to come and speak uh, their mind, to share their thoughts uh, and insights on how we should be moving forward. This is our country. Uganda is our country. Uh, we may not be living there right now, some of us who are in the diaspora, but we still have families and property uh, in that country, so we do have ties uh, in that country. Uh, we think that it's important for us to have these conversations uh, with our colleagues on the ground. 
so that we can better understand the contexts um, which some of us examine from afar. I think it's important for us to have these conversations with our brothers and sisters on the ground. Uh, another person in the studio with us today is going to be Sayon Helen uh, and, of course, Basil Mota. Uh, Sayon Helen is here. Of course, she's still struggling with the internet. She keeps coming and uh, coming in and out. Uh, but uh, whenever it's stable, uh, we shall definitely uh, let her in. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to invite my brother, Mr. Julius Mitala, also counsel, uh, to introduce himself. Uh, of course, we were with him last weekend. Uh, this is just part two of that conversation. Last weekend, we heard from uh, General uh, Engineer Tony Olang uh, and uh, Economist Susan Namata. Uh, of course, with uh, Julius Mitala in the house. Uh, Julius Mitala is back. He's a regular, you know, he is a regular state of the nation uh, panelist. Uh, but today we have new two new faces. Uh, perhaps that explains why they are still struggling with getting into uh, the, the studio. But they will be they, they will be in as soon as possible. Uh, Mr. Julius, nice to have you back. Yes, Henry, thank you very much. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure you know, to be here. You know, for me, this is my Sunday. It's my Sunday cup of tea. It's my Sunday biscuit. You know, when I talk about a cup of tea, that's typical of, uh, you know, the British way of life. You cannot talk about a, a, a British way of life and not talk about a cup of tea. Of, of, even though that is representative of, you know, of, of, of the empire, you know, cups of teas and stories of slavery and so on and so forth. But yeah, it's great to be here. Henry, thank you for availing us the space to have these uh, uh, honest discussions. Of course, we are grateful to the, uh, the, the University of Toronto African Alumni Association for providing the space as well. Uh, without wasting so much time, Julius Mitala is my name. I'm based in the UK. I've been here for a while. Uh, my background is legal. Um, I prefer to be to go by the name Mitala Muzukuruam Swangari as per my screen. And I'm I'm glad to be back, you know, to continue the conversation about the processes of transition and change and truth and reconciliation, the commissions and so on and so forth. I think there will be quite a number of questions that we we'll want to be exploring and trying to, you know, put some context into some of those issues because this is a really, really important discussion especially where we happen to be as a nation presently that we are you know we are really at uh we are we are really at that juncture where these conversations are really and truly necessary you know if you look at the turmoil the tensions on a tribal from a tribal perspective and all the persisting all the other persisting issues you know that are you know constraining us as a nation as a people to be able to forge you know uh, healthy ways forward. So I'm really definitely looking forward to this conversation and I hope my colleagues uh, together we shall be able to make a contribution towards that for today. Thank you very much, Henry. Uh, and of course, uh, as we continue to have this conversation, and uh, I mean, before we start having this conversation for real, uh, I know that uh, you live in the UK. Uh, I know that uh, the world has experienced uh, the saddest death uh, beside my mom's, of course, uh, the, the saddest death uh, uh, of the world, uh, the world seems to be saddened, uh, if not really saddened, uh, about the, the, the passing of uh, His Her Majesty the Queen, mm -hmm. uh, who passed on uh, this week, or last week, this Sunday, so last week. Mm. Uh, how is the feeling there? I know, uh, I know, Mota will be speaking about his experience meeting the Queen uh, in London. Uh, did you meet the Queen? Yeah, you, you live in the uh, in the UK. Did you did you meet the Queen before? Uh, and uh, what, what are your thoughts? How are you guys uh, keeping on and uh, uh, I, trying I, to I, mourn the Queen? I am just an ordinary failure, so I've not had the opportunity to meet the Queen. You know, my meeting with the Queen has literally been, you know, virtual, you know, on TV, if I should put it just like everybody else. But there has been so many moments, you know, where I feel like uh, 
you have in some respects personally interacted with this lady and uh you know you one has really to 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 acknowledge the fact that she's been a pillar she's been a strong pillar not only in the united kingdom but across where within the commonwealth and uh, all the other realms where she's uh, the head of state i am pretty sure that she will be missed uh it's uh, a transforming moment it's a significant moment that many of us perhaps will never be able to witness again and uh you know as much as there is the sadness in her passing but also there is uh the realization that uh you know something huge and significant has just happened you know you know, you know on our watch you know because if you think about it and i think one of for me one of the things that uh this brings up it, it brings it brings up you know this great admiration and respect for an institution that is able to conduct itself amidst all the challenges to conduct right. itself the way it conducts itself and still preserves its relevancy because that's really something that is uh it's huge and it is significant i have watched very closely uh for obvious reasons that uh, we are having a new head of state uh, in the names of uh, Charles III now, who was traditionally been known as the Prince of Wales or just simply Prince Charles. He's now ascended the throne. Uh, there's a very different dynamics. Uh, uh, I believe he's a very experienced man. You know, he's been there side by side, step by step with his mother over the years for over 76 years you know i think if, if you if you if you talk about apprenticeships if you if you talk about learning on the job i don't think there's anybody who can you know lay that claim to learning on the job than than than, than the current king king charles so I've, I've listened to him i've listened to his speeches and i think uh he provides the the, the reassurance he obviously He's obviously taking over the 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 the, 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 the throne at a very challenging time without knowing whether you know the institution or the community of the Commonwealth <clears throat> can be preserved going forward. You know, uh, you you can see all these uh, you know forces that are pulling across so many different different areas. We hope that uh, you know. Uh, we, we can only hope that common sense will prevail. Right. Uh, those who want to go their separate ways, of course, they are free to go their separate separate ways. But I think, uh, you know, these institutions, whether we want them or not, I think they have a purpose to serve. And I think that purpose is for the good cause overall. So it will be sad really to miss the Queen, but I think there is assurance in the fact that uh, there is very clear continuity and uh, it is hoped that... Uh, it will be okay going forward. Uh, w w when she just passed, uh, one of the very first comments you made uh, to me was that this is a momentous uh, moment in our lives. It uh, is. Uh, and I think uh, those words actually uh, signify uh, the moment as it was. Uh, we were following the, the events very closely, uh, very early in the morning. I, I usually wake up and ride, if not to run, uh, before I go to work. Uh, and I was on my bike listening to some news, uh, trying to catch up uh, on the world news. And I heard that uh, she had, uh, she was being closely monitored uh, mm -hmm. by her doctors. And of course, uh, the Prince uh, of Wales, the Prince of Cornwall, who, who is the same person, the, 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 the new king now. Uh, and uh, his sons had to trek uh, to, uh, to Scotland to, 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 to meet their mom, uh, the Queen of England, the Queen of the UK. Uh, I've never had that kind of communication before. Uh, and and uh, watching CNN as it does uh, usually, monitoring every moment uh, uh, of her last uh, moment as a queen. Like it was really momentous. Uh, and for us who who are also who pay allegiance to the queen, uh, now the king, King uh, uh, King Charles the the third. Uh, of course, we are following these events very closely, mm -hmm. uh, and this happens. Well, this happens at this time. Uh, we know that there are very many forces who are uh, 
uh, trying to disintegrate uh, the Commonwealth and uh, everything that has happened uh, from uh, reanalyzing history uh, and bringing talking about the, the without some 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 without even uh, putting it, uh, it in the context in place uh and you wonder how we are going to proceed uh, but like you said i think uh king uh, king charles the third uh is very well experienced we, we we are going to interrogate this in a on a different day probably uh trying to um trying to compare life presidencies yeah. <laughs> to <laughs> to the monarch and uh, the bringing up of uh, uh our or the hairs or the the people who come to take over uh as sovereigns uh, i think what i appreciated most with the with the king what i realized is that when the queen passed mm -hmm. charles automatically became king which means that the sovereign did not did, did not die there was no there was no gap there, there was no, no gap whatsoever that i think there, that's amazing no that, yeah. like, when do we start planning like that as africans like the moment because i've been watching this documentary london mm. bridge is down mm. Mm. And now I realized actually London Bridge was deliberate and it's actually there. It is a structure that was created and they follow it uh, to the script. Mm. Yet we do not have these kinds of structures in Africa, even within our cultural contexts, the Buganda Kingdom, the Toro Kingdom, the Busoga Kingdom. Like, they, there's always uncertainty uh, with, mm. with such a... Like we, we, we somehow so, somehow uh, always lose a sovereign when, when we shouldn't be losing a sovereign. Yeah, you but know, anyway, that, that would yeah, be another conversation. I yeah, think it, um, it it would be it would be a very uh, and, I, and I don't want to do injustice to uh, Mr. Mr. Buzzing, Morgan. Yeah, <laughs> I I know he's here listening into us. But just very quickly to add on to that, you know, there's just just, just there's just two points I want to make very quickly. I think one of the charges that I've had, for instance, from uh, uh, Julius Malema or Julius Molema of South Africa, you know, yeah, the economic freedom fighters. You know, he's he published a very strong statement, as you know, uh, stating that you know, for them as the EAF, they do not mourn the passing of the Queen because they attribute most of the sufferings of the people in Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere you know, to the, to the forces that she represented. In as much as that is true, but I think what somebody cannot take away is that, uh, I mean, let's, 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 let's think about uh, independent Africa, you know. This woman, if she accessed the throne in 1952, just somewhere there, just a few years later, Africa was beginning to, be, to, to, that was beginning to consolidate the journey towards its independence. And the first country that we see becoming independent in Africa is Ghana, 1957. So she had been on the throne just for a couple of days. You know, bi biblically, you know, for those who, who are Christians and believers, there is always that saying that, you know, you don't visit the sins of the son or the father onto, onto the child. So, yes, the empire had its problems, but I think this woman has, uh, she, she has gone about business with uh, a lot of respect and dignity. Uh, she's uh, she's been the epitome of humility, if you could put it that way. She's provided stability, which is very important for any country that that desires to develop and you know move forward in terms of, of, of things of that context. So it, she will really be missed. And for us, for, for those of us, this young generation, it is really a moment to ponder. It's a moment to reflect on and think about. Think about the lubrication of the. The, the British royal system, and especially what you are referencing there, that uh, you know, the, there is no even space for for the gap. That uncertainty does not exist, and I think that creates that stability and you know, being able for countries to maneuver themselves and move forward without so much uh, you know uh, conflict and difficulties. So it is it, it it's really important, and uh, it's a big moment. But we shall we shall see how the story develops further from there on. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mitala. You are a lawyer. We do have uh, a lawyer in waiting, uh, Mr. Basil. Uh, Moda Basil Bidemu is, uh, he, he is a law student at Macquarie University. Uh, he is a qualified teacher, uh, of course, from Macquarie University. 
uh, and he has had an opportunity to meet the queen uh we i'm very interested in uh, hearing uh, what uh, what his story is what uh, what he feels right now uh and uh, if he can talk to us about uh what he felt when uh, when the queen passed and uh, uh perhaps even some of the conversations they had with the queen because i've been listening a lot uh, to, to, to 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 some of the uh the interactions that people have had with the queen uh, specifically i followed uh the the common uh the, the house of commons in in, in the uk uh, each mp was talking about their moment with the queen the conversations they had uh, uh and i think those tell you a little bit about the person that we only watch on tv some of us mm -hmm. uh so when you hear those, those moments uh, from people who have actually interacted with the person uh you get to uh, perhaps understand that uh, even though the sovereign was uh, that powerful uh, there was an aspect of uh, humanity within her uh, and that's what i think we need to interrogate and uh, uh, try to understand what was she as a grandma what was she as a mother of course those who, who can only hear from the the royal the royals uh, but then what was he as a human being those are the small conversations we hear from the bazils uh, of this world and uh, the, the the MPs from the, the House of Commons. So, Basil, uh, nice. First, first of all, thank you for coming to the State of the the, the Nation. We are excited to have you. Uh, tell us about your experience about the Queen before we go into we delve into our conversation whether uh, Uganda is ripe for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yes, thank you very much, Henry, uh, for this opportunity, and uh, thank you for having us. My internet has been intermittent. You know the internet of Uganda. But uh, I'm glad that uh, I can now be heard and I can join you all. My name is Basil Mota. I am a student of law. I am now in my fourth year at Macquarie University. Meeting the Queen. Wow. I barely slept the night before because for me it was unbelievable. Uh, a young man from Kamocha, from the ghetto, being given an opportunity to meet the queen. And uh, <clears throat> when I met her, she, she was a humble person. She was interested to listen about what I do, about how I do it, about where I stay, how I, ca how I came to do it. And for me, the news of her demise hit me really hard. It's one thing to know someone. It's one thing to hear about someone or watch them on TV. It's another to have met them, to have shared memories with them. You could feel how human the queen is, even when people have different things they say about her, some good, some bad. But when you meet her in person, <clears throat> You see humanity, and uh, that is what leadership is about. It's about being human, uh, showing courtesy, uh, showing that uh, you're concerned about the people, about what the young people are doing. Uh, through the Queen's Young Leaders Initiative, the Queen was able not only to meet 240 people, among who I, I am, but also empower them, because we did a leadership training program in Cambridge, University and through the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, she's been according grants to youth to help them on top of all the other things. So her demise really hit me hard, and uh, I pray that uh, her soul rests in peace. But we are, we are, we have solace in the new King Charles. Uh, <clears throat> I did meet him when I was uh, in Buckingham, but. Over the years, he has shown that he is an able leader, and I believe that England is in good hands. All right, the UK, uh, and of course, the, the, the entire Commonwealth is uh, uh, in good hands. Of course, uh, uh, we now say that uh, long live uh, the, the king. Uh, Sayun is finally here with us, and we are excited to 
uh, to have you, uh, Sayun. I'm going to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Uh, and uh, if you have any uh, any comments regarding the, the, the Queen, you're, you're welcome to say them. But of course, uh, we commensurate with the, with the UK, uh, the royal family, and of course, uh, the entire Commonwealth, uh, those who believe in it and those who do not believe in it yet. Uh, I think the conversation uh, continues. Uh, Sayun, welcome to the State of the Nation. Uh, introduce yourself. Unmute and introduce yourself. I know the internet has been disturbing you, so hopefully you can actually speak and we can hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Eh? I'm not sure if you're speaking because I can't see your picture. Yes, uh, can you get me now? Yes. Oh, yes. Good evening, Henry and uh, the two uh, co-panelists. Uh, I've been struggling with, with network. I've actually not been able to get it in my house, so I'm outside in the darkness. That's why I'm unable to put on my video. I know. It's okay. Yes. But I'm yeah. so glad to be here. Uh, this is what I would say. I, the topic is, is very timely. In fact, I've have had this talk, started to talk about these things like, like in the 2000s when I was a little bit more young. Um, uh, maybe to commiserate with the uh, UK and uh, with the death of the Queen, we are really uh, feeling sorry for those people. And uh, Uganda, I know, is among the Commonwealth countries, so we really commiserate with the uh, with the uh, people of the UK. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Uh... Sayun for joining us once again. You are the uh, vice president of UID. Is that right? Oh, yes. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess now we are going to uh, get into the Ugandan conversation. Uh, uh, and I want to give Council Mittal an opportunity to start this conversation because he was here last uh, weekend. Uh, of course, uh, the panelists last weekend seemed to all agree that uh, Uganda is ripe for a truth and reconcil uh, Re reconciliation commission. So, Mr. Mitala, first of all, uh, I want you to bring us to speed, especially the, 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 you, you, your two fellow panelists. What, what is the importance of having a truth and reconciliation commission? What would that uh, mean for Uganda? Uh, and why, why, why do you think it's important? To start with, um, I think to draw the, the background, and I, I'm not going to try to go so much into the detail because I'm pretty sure you know that the followers will be able to follow this conversation and the panelists will also be able to follow this conversation very briefly. But uh, we just need to understand what is uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, what, it's, what, what is its purpose, what is its limitation? And then we, we ask ourselves the question that, uh, you know, does the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, if any, does it, how does it impact, how does it affect our democratization process? How does it help us heal the wounds? How does it help us form, you know, that common, common journey? How do we embark on that common journey together, you know, without, uh, without, you know, involving ourselves so much into conflict and, uh, social disharmony and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that I would say right from the onset is that truth and reconciliation, um, truth and reconciliation commissions or truth commissions as they are, you know, so commonly referred to, they have become very, very popular and very common in uh, international human rights jurisprudence. But I think um, that they, these have been employed so much in areas, countries that are emerging from conflict, because obviously, as you know, Post-conflict, uh, there is always a need for people to have some form of reflection, sit back and understand what are the causes of the problems that you have endured and uh, how could you possibly be able to avoid those problems re being repeated going forward. There are always uh, crimes of, uh, of a heinous nature that are committed during times of conflict either from uh, one party to another, but these crimes are usually committed against, uh, you know, innocent people, you know, 
And this is where truth and reconciliation commissions come into play. The question that somebody gets to ask themselves that are they an alternative? Could they be an alternative to, you know, to, to, to justice, to the, to, the, to the court procedure systems, to judicial systems as a, as, as a mechanism of resolving conflict and, uh, you know, facilitating peace and stable communities? So that, that is really the context of where we are. Now, to put that into the picture, we, we, we have to look at, our, at, our, at ourselves. You know, somebody, mesh, somebody stated somewhere that, you know, in order for a community to be comfortable with, with itself, that community has got to accept its own illusions. You know, we, we, ha we have to set the terms of our own truths. You know, what are our truths? What are those sorts of things we are willing to accept that this is our truth? And of course, that means coming face to face with the reality of the past and uh, all the troubles that we have encountered, you know, in the past, so that we can be able to set an agenda that takes us forward uh, towards a journey of peace. So truth and reconciliation, I think that's for me, that's my understanding. Obviously, as we did discuss last weekend, we, we agreed that uh, there is a need for a truth and reconciliation kind of uh, arrangement in the current Ugandan context. There are, there, there are so many, there, 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 is, there, there, there is demand, there is, there, there is hunger, there is anger, there is uh, disunity, there is uh, disjunction among the people, you know, there is tribalism, there, there is a group of people that feel that they have been let, left behind, you know, they are not sharing in the national cake. There is aspects of, uh, you know, human rights violations, you know, abductions, murder, you know, people unable to access, you know, the court system and get justice and fairness, you know, de disenfranchisation, you know, loss of uh, access to property rights, name them and all those sorts of things. So the ingredients for a truth and reconciliation kind of arrangement in our Ugandan context are ready and they are available. So we then ask the question that if we are accepting that uh, we are at that juncture where we are ready to have those national conversations for the purpose of uh, you know facilitating our peace and stability in the context of the transition, you know, because obviously there is a current arrangement and it's a given fact. We have been talking about the demise of the queen. She's been on the helm of government of state for the Commonwealth over two billion people, you know, across fifty-six nations. For 70 years a time came and she had to give way time will come where the current leadership in uganda will have to give way whether you want it or not time will come where the, the, the leadership will have to give way. but if they do give way what do they bequeath what is the inheritance that they are bequeathing uganda you know we were told in 1986 that we are going through a fundamental change and uh, lots of things have happened ever since then. We can evaluate whether that fundamental change was actually fundamental change. Uh, what sort of, uh, you know, substantial, substantive change has it brought in the lives of day-to-day -day common people, you know? And again, we did state that, uh, you know, we have had an attempt at truth and reconciliation twice in our Uganda's history, 1974, uh, we had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was a whitewash because uh, the late President Idi Amin that succumbed to international pressure, uh, you know, amid this, the ongoing, you know, accusations of uh, human rights violations, mass murders, you know, political detentions and, uh, you know, abductions and all those sorts of things. So he needed to, to get the international community off his chest. And on account of that, he succumbed to a commission in 1974 whose report was published is duly available following on that we had the second attempt in 1986 and the recommendations of that report or the findings of that report were that there had been very serious you know human rights violations and uh, those those are challenges we needed to face head on in order for us to be able to forge a way forward with the whole intention that we should not return to where we to the period that we have been examining in the past. Unfortunately, as a matter of fact, if you look at our current situation, all those things that we are investigated by the uh, factual finding mission of the late uh, Justice Ode, uh, Mr. Nagenda, uh, Mr. Philip Sekandi, 
uh, Stephen, Stephen, Mr. Sekandi, who was the Speaker of Parliament and Vice President later on, all those issues that were, you know, investigated or look, looked at at the 1986 fact-finding mission, abductions, state abductions, you no know, uh, violations of human rights uh, um, elements of all kind, you know, detention without trial, and so forth, so on and so forth. All those things seem to be existent in our context today. So the question for me is, what were the missed opportunities? And if there were those missed opportunities, how can we be able to navigate ourselves away from those kind of challenges? So that, that is the context of the background to, to the discussion today. Right. And uh, you, you talk about missed opportunities. What were they uh, and how, how can we uh, move forward from where we are today? Because, of course, it is evident that there's a lot of uh, uh, tribal, uh, tribal sentiments uh, that are not uh, very good. These seem to be... Uh, continuing to increase instead of uh, uh, decreasing. Uh, and, of course, the leadership uh, seems to be, uh, to think that uh, they're unshakable and therefore they do not, uh, uh, I don't know what they are thinking actually, but they do not seem to uh, to think about uh, democratic engagements with the citizens of Uganda. Uh, especially because uh, last, last weekend you talked about uh, having uh, presidential directives uh, instead of having a democracy. Institutions do not work anymore. Uh, even the courts of law seem to be listening to, to, to one uh, person who tells them whatever they want to do. Uh, this week I had uh, 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 a few comments from the speaker. Uh, and uh, of course we have heard that uh, she's being trailed. We don't know to what extent that, 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 that how true that is. Uh, but when you hear all these uh, back and forth uh, seeming conflicts within our institutions, you have to wonder where our country is going and whether we are ready uh, to take on the leadership of that country if we are not willing to talk about uh, the seeming wrongs or weaknesses that are within our institution. Uh, that are within our institutions. I'm going to invite the lady in the house. Uh, Ms. Sayun, what are your thoughts? How, how do you see the state of uh, the country as it is right now? Uh, and uh, have you thought about uh, this notion of having a truth and reconciliation commission? Do you think uh, when Ugandans convene and speak their truth about how they should be governed, uh, and how they have been governed in the past and how they think they should be governed going forward. Do you think that's a conversation that is necessary? Uh, and how should that conversation be brought about uh, within our context? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sally and uh, the co-panelists. Uh, sorry to the question. I think it is actually very, very timely for us to have the talk. Um, when you talk of reconciliation, that means there are some people that are aggrieved. When you talk of the truth, that means there are people that are not talking, have not been talking about people that haven't been telling us the truth. So I believe it is the time that it is high time that we sat down as a country. And how are we going to sit down? We have cultural leaders, we have religious leaders, we have political leaders, and we have those who we trust, though not in position, but are people who we know that when they get there, they can actually speak on our behalf. What, what do I mean here? We, there, there, is a, there are a lot of divides in this country. We must accept that the divides are between, the, there are the people that have power, the people who actually completely have no power, they're powerless. Then we've got actually another, another battle that we are not actually looking at as generation, but there's also another battle of generation. You discover there are three generations in the middle here. There is the generation of the present Museveni, there is the generation of the, the Honorable Robert Mao, and there is a generation of the Bo Bobby Wines, and now there is another generation of Poppy. So all those generations have different grievances. You discover we are in a government 
where we have uh, political leaders, uh, someone sits, someone says, I cannot dine with Ajunta. In other words, I cannot meet President Museveni. That itself shows you that there is a grievance in between us. You discover there is, there is oh, lately we lost, uh, uh, we lost uh, General Eli Tumwine. You saw how, how some people were over media celebrating. What does it show? It shows you that there are people that are not happy with something. And that happiness is, that unhappiness and dissatisfaction is what causes the truth and reconciliation. We have, we have uh, truth and reconciliation would, would not only focus on the past, it focuses on the past, actually. So we have people of the Duelo Triumph, people who were slept, people massacred. We have the, 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 the North the northern part of Uganda that took over 14 years struggling with FRA. We we are not talking about that. We we have we have a lot of divides that actually call for us to have this truth and reconciliation and reconciliation commission. We need to sit on the round table and talk to each other. What does this mean? We need we need people who there is need for amnesty for those that will confess us. There is something that has been done. There is need for reparation or, or maybe compensation for some people that that will have. But we have a lot of people here that are hurt as a result of what is going on. We need sober minds to sit together and agree that this government or this country as Uganda is bigger than all of us. And that's we need to sit and discuss and redirect this country to where we want it to be apart from having a few people who will sit somewhere and design it for us. We have to agree that we are all stakeholders in this government or in this country as Uganda, because we can never have another country as Uganda. Uh, trust me, you were born in Uganda, you can go somewhere, have there some peace for two, three years, but Uganda remains, and this is where we, we have to shape it. I want to thank you that you're outside the country, but you take in the responsibility to have such platforms to which we can discuss and maybe sh uh, provide shape for Uganda. At, at least that is a credit for me to you, uh, Mr. Sadi. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Mr. Yun, uh, for that uh, uh, perspective about why we must have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, of course, one of the, 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 the most important aspects of your, your, your insights or your conversation is that the aggrieved, the aggrieved must be listened to by those with power. And I think that's very important. Uh, of course, when you see people celebrating death, uh, you must not first and foremost be upset that they are celebrating death, but you must question, you must ask yourself, why? Why are people responding in such a manner? And uh, what do we need to change to ensure that this does not continue to happen? Uh, even when we have disagreements among ourselves. Mr. Mota, you have had the conversation. Uh, what are your thoughts? I know you are you're a qualified teacher. Of course, you know the aspects uh, of, the, of education and uh, uh, how that uh, translates into your growth as a, a young man who wants to uh, develop the country. You are also uh, very much involved in charity, uh, but now you are also pursuing law. Do you think we have a case when we, we say that we should have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And how is it going to help uh, Uganda become a better country? Uh Yes, thank you very much, Henry. There is need for a candid and honest conversation about the injustice, the injustices in Uganda, because there are injustices there. The question is, how will they do this? What will the commission constitute? Because uh, like uh, Council Mitala has told us, I, I want to, to add on what a truth commission is. And a truth commission, and many people have referred to, ESA, to it as a truth and reconciliation commission, or truth and justice commission. 
It is an official body tasked with discovering and revealing past wrongdoing by a government in the hope of resolving conflict left over from the past. We've seen a lot of these. Uh, for example, in 1996, there was one in South Africa after apartheid. The question is, right now, whereas we all agree that there is need of uh, having candid conversations, honest conversations, who will constitute mission? Because then they will delve into some of the matters that have been unfair or unjust in the past 30 years or so. And if the current government is to appoint whoever will be on the commission, then there will be no candid conversation. There will not be honest conversation. Uh, Councilor Mitala will tell you about separation of power and uh, the, the, the principle of Nemo Judex in Casa Swa. If this government is the one to select whoever will be on the commission, then there will, no, there will not be truth. There will not be justice. There will not be uh, a fairness. But there is need for one. But we also need to talk about transition. When should we get a new government? How should we get it? Because it is then that the Truth and the Justice Commission will be more relevant. We can always have these conversations. And uh, I thank uh, Mr. Henry for putting there such platforms, such forums where we can come out and speak about these things. But there is a need for a legal body, a recognized body that will come in and ask the questions that people do not want to hear and find out the truth that is there so that people get justice. Because a lot of people's rights have been infringed upon and there is need for, for a truth and justice commission. So it is only then that we shall realize at least a bit of fairness. We've seen in South Africa to date, uh, Mr. Malema comes out and says, well, you gave us independence, but which kind of independence is it? Is it economic? No, it isn't. You only gave us a right to vote, but we do not own land. It is hard to start a business if you're an African in South Africa, or if you are a black African because even the whites call themselves South Africans. So there is need for that independent commission. And the only way to get it is through a peaceful transition. And then the next government can establish that commission that will look into the matters that were unjust and unfair. Like it was in South Africa, like I said, it was after the apartheid that the whites or the Britons said, okay, now we hand over power to the blacks. Then a commission was formed and then they were able, even though it's not a hundred percent that they realized their benefits, the truth was brought up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Council to be, uh, Council to be, uh, Basil. Uh, Mr. Mitala, uh, when you hear these insights uh, from these, uh, uh, young men and women in Uganda who are also striving to ensure that we have a candid conversation uh, to ensure that uh, uh, as we continue engaging in these conversations, we are listening to each other and that even the people who have the power right now are listening. Uh, Mr. Mota brings in something, another aspect of transition. Uh, and he brings it in deliberately because he says that it's very hard to have a credible uh, truth and justice, truth and uh, reconciliation commission uh, when the exact government that is supposed to facilitate uh, that commission is the same that uh, perhaps the truth could be said about. Uh, when we talk about 
the creation of these forums that we are having these conversations seemingly candid conversations we try to be honest and deliberate here uh, but we also do it knowing very well that uh, most recently there is a computer misuse uh, bill or amendment bill that that, 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 that that was passed and uh, uh, perhaps is going to be assented to by the president how do we continue having these truth conversations before the major truth or established truth and reconciliation commission uh, when there are bumps that are coming in to trump so these kinds of conversations uh, mr bitala what what are your thoughts uh, as we move forward with this conversation um i i, I very much um uh enjoy the points that have been raised by uh, uh mr mota basil uh, it's quite very interesting co uh, points there that are being raised uh, obviously these these are things that we talked about last week and we said that um uh, you know in order for these fact finding commissions to be effective there needs to be political willingness the edge there's got to be the political buy-ins by the political elite in order to you know make these processes you know effective and meaningful otherwise without that you know the whole exercise is a whitewash and it takes us back to the previous two that we have had which we have already analyzed and made the conclusion that they were whitewashed because the 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 the, 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 the starting point there was there, there was no there was no sincerity in these processes there was no sincerity there was a lack of transparency. Uh, Basil talked about uh, who are the who are the people who are going to be you know, charged with carrying out these functions and these exercises. What sort of people are we looking at? And again, I raised this 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 this, this sentiment last week that you know we need to look at the suitability of the candidates who are being to be who are going to sit on those panels to make those determinations. Now. <clears throat> Ultimately, for me as a lawyer, I take uh, a little bit of a different approach because my approach, I pose it in questions. And the question that I would ask is that, does the truth and, well, these fact-finding commissions, the truth and reconciliation commissions, if we had one, what impact could they have on our democratization process? Because one of the things that you really can't take away from these reconciliation processes is that there has got to be public engagement. This is not about the other party. It's about the public. It's about the people, you know. But there has got to be that willingness by those who have got power or those who are in charge to put themselves aside and accept and acknowledge. You know, the whole exercise is about acknowledging that, hey, look here, I think we have a problem. And if we are having a problem, can we talk? And if we can talk, how does this problem, how does it affect people on the receiving end? You know, for me, I always want to look at it in the in, 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 in a juncta, juxtaposed kind of scenario where I'm asking myself the question is that would uh, truth and reconciliation processes, would they be a substitute to to to, to prosecute your justice to to our, you know, state? unknown court systems would it be a substitute because it's different you know you know it's different for it's, it's different to talk about and come here in when we are animated you know a very fine english and talk about discuss you know the different different aspects of uh, truth and reconciliation commissions and what they can do and what they cannot do without tackling the issue of impunity because the entire essential essence of the law is to punish i mean a society that is not that that cannot punish its wrongs cannot cannot heal you know for me that's the perspective that i take because first of all wrongs have been committed against other people yes the truth and reconciliation arrangements can serve a benefit can 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 serve a certain purpose but i think our starting point should be the prosecution aspect of it accept accept except if we are willing to acknowledge the fact and accept that you know yeah uh, we, we do not have the capacity you know to to go through you know the, the 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 judicial systems as we would in in normal circumstances because i'll set out for you the benefits of uh, of, of, of having a prosecution as against uh, having uh, a truth and reconciliation kind of thing first of all prosecutions they help to establish the rule of law 
because then everybody is clear on what what are the rules what is acceptable within the confines of the law and what is not acceptable you know so that is the first starting point you know we have we have to look at we, we have we have to look at the situation that advances the rule of law so that it makes every man equal you know before the courts of justice that if you henry if me julius or if you basil you've committed a crime against another human being the first standing point is not for you to be granted a pardon without even you acknowledging that you know i have committed a crime because you have to there has got to be that acknowledgement that's the starting point and i'm saying here that you know we have got to be able to face up to our you know illusions and 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 accept our truths and our facts that this is what the problem is and therefore we know what the problem is so how do we navigate away from that then we can make the choices and say okay we are going either prosecutorial or we are going into a truth and reconciliation kind of situation so for me that's the approach i'll take so so uh you know prosecution sets a firm foundation for assessing the benefit and compensation of the victims and even though in even though in in in, in truth and reconciliation commissions their mechanism is there you know to, to to navigate all these issues who are the victims give them an opportunity to be able to tell their story and so on and so forth but i think uh, we run a risk especially in the kind of issues that basil has raised that the legitimacy of this of, of these processes is always at stake because number one um especially in situations like ours even if we are talking about a transition here you know that is we are hoping that the current establishment will be able to stand aside or maybe we will go through an election like the sort of thing that we have seen in kenya where you know uh, there has been a clear and transparent process of change of power from one person to another, you know, and therefore the, the new coming administration now can set itself on a path of saying, okay, we are going to have a truth and reconciliation kind of process because it's a, a new set of arrangement. But the, 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 the disadvantage on the other side is that these sorts of, uh, you know, the, 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 the truth and reconciliation process in a transitional kind of arrangement we are talking about, they they tend to, to bring on board the strongman as well, or agents or elements of the strongman, people who have been at the core of, uh, you know, perpetuating these uh, excess excesses and human rights abuses. They will be part and parcel of the new system, the new arrangement, and therefore they are going to frustrate the whole process. So there, there, there are those issues that we need to be looking about. I mean, prosecution sends a very clear message, you know, to, to 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 the other block that you know certain conduct is not is not going to be accepted because you are at risk if you engage in this kind of it's a deterrent kind of mechanism if you engage in this kind of you know conduct you know the risk is that you'll be prosecuted and therefore it puts a control it puts like bar that barrier of control a layer of control over what people can and what people cannot do you know but then we have the situation where you know court orders are deliberately ignored you know the high court makes an order and the court the order is it doesn't exist it's not being made you know and how do we trust in the, the the people who are in charge of these processes they are independent of the current uh in in our current arrangement so these are questions that we need to be looking about you know so again i'm saying that uh you know prosecution can facilitate the proper healing process of society it can really facilitate that because, uh, you know, as I'm saying, a society that cannot punish its wrongs cannot really think about genuine healing because there has got to be some kind of retribution. You know, they, 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 the saying is that justice has got to be seen to be done, you know. So would you be able to bring all these aggrieved people on board Ex unless there is a consensus, unless there is a... There is some kind of referendum where the people will say, okay, we are we, we as a people, we are choosing and we are we, we think it's best for us to go through a truth and reconciliation process as opposed to a prosecutory kind of process. Then, of course, if that's the decision of the people, it's the decision of the people. And uh, in any democratic dispensation, the decision of the people, decision of the masses is critically important. But for me, the point I'm making is that there has got to be that strong willingness 
from the political elite and also from within the masses to acknowledge that uh, we have problems amongst ourselves within our society, that they are problems. And until we acknowledge that they are problems, I think the, the, the process of confronting these problems, which with whichever process we choose, which, whichever direction we choose to go, it becomes more meaningful, it becomes more realistic after there's been that acknowledgement that, you know, here is a problem, we acknowledge there's a problem, this is how we are going to deal with this problem. At the moment, I do not sense that. And because I'm not sensing that there is that willingness to acknowledge that there is a problem, then the only alternative that I can think about is to pursue, you know, prosecution, either at a domestic level or in any international fora, whichever is uh, reasonably achievable for us. That would be my approach in that kind of scenario. You are muted, Henry. Sorry, what, what I'm hearing you say is that uh, uh, th this conversation, while uh, seemingly important, may not yield a lot of uh, good, given that the, even when the, such an entity is established, uh, it may not yield the results that uh, we are looking for, first of all, because uh, there's no political will and there's no acceptance uh, of wrongdoing by the, the powerful. Uh, of course, uh, even last week you, you mentioned that uh, truth and reconciliation commissions usually do not have the power to implement their recommendations. Uh, but now you have also asked a, another very important question, uh, which is that what should be the basis of assessing and compensating uh, the, the victims uh, of course, we have to establish who the victims are, who are the victims, uh, and uh, that justice has got to be saved in order to be done. Now, my question, uh, uh, and this, this is a question to both, uh, to, to, to both Mr. Mota and uh, uh, Helen, uh, do you folks think that uh, we can afford to believe in a truth and reconciliation commission when we are having trouble believing uh, in our institutions such as uh, the parliament, the justice system, uh, can there be trust for such an entity if it's created, if there's no trust for the legislature or the justice system, uh, or even the executive, because the executive, uh, even when it's referred to as one, uh, it seems to be working on the directives of the one person uh, that leads that executive. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are, uh, Helen, starting with you. Uh, uh, well, my thoughts are, here we're talking about truth and reconciliation. Your voice is very low. Oh, I, uh, you can get me well now? Yeah, that's better. Yes. I am saying we are talking about truth and reconciliation. And we are talking about the truth as not a hoax, but truth as in definition as truth. If we are to talk about uh, uh, truth, then that means we should start with it, even with the composition of the people that will institute the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We should set it independent, first of all. That is where the truth will start from. But the moment we restrict it again to appointments which are not legit and which are not on merit, still we shall have problems and it will not perform to its perfection. So the best, the best way of it is having it as an independence. Independent, based on merit, based on legitimacy. Not that it is based on this is my person. And good. At least for now, we have a very independent institution that is the Democratic Party to which I subscribe to. We had this very Truth and Reconciliation Commission in our 2021 manifesto. Now, our Honorable Minister is the one to spearhead it. And this is, I tell you, is a katengo. Because we have got to exercise what we can ably do in this ministry. So, we must first of all exercise the independency 
and that, know that we are working for Ugandans. First of all, it will start with dialogue. We must dialogue within ourselves. And it is through dialogue that we shall discover whether this, this happened and this happened. I am uh, still thinking about the persecution that uh, uh, Council Mitara is talking about. Because now when you talk of, of, uh, of prosecution and then uh, you look into this government, I do not know that... Can, I don't, I do not know whether that can work because even if it's you and you two, we are talking about the truth. You're going to talk about the truth, and you know, next to prosecution, you're you're headed for this. It will it will have uh, a little bit of scrabble. So the truth that we are talking about, actually, I am glad uh, Mota brought in the issue of transition. The truth that we are talking about is the fact that this and this happened, but we need this country to head here. Yes, the heading here we are talking about right now is transition, which is very, very necessary and timely. It has actually delayed. So can we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission very independent, set aside to play the, that role? If not, then we, we are seated on a time bomb and anything can happen within the shortest period of time. Right. Thank you so much uh, for, for those insights. Uh, Mr. Mota, your thoughts, uh, you, of course, you have been cited in the previous uh, conversation. So what are your thoughts and uh, how do we establish an independent Truth and Reconstitution Commission, really, uh, within this context? Or should we first go through transition, then think about establishing such an entity? And is that feasible? In this context well uh with all due respect uh, allow me to start with this the police has a right to shoot you and to kill you with all due respect for reconciliation to happen the, the catholic church has a, a very good practice of reconciliation through the sacrament of penance one has to recognize that they are at fault. One has to state his or her sin and then seek absolution. When you say the police has a right to shoot you and kill you, it means that the injustices done are valid in your eyes. My question is, if we, the public, if we, the people, are willing to reconcile, is the government willing to reconcile? Are they willing to accept that, look here, in 2020, before the election, Noob claims that 450 people were abducted unlawfully. Are we able, is the government able to accept that this happened? As I speak now, Facebook is normal in Uganda. There is that freedom of expression. It is a, a right. Is it there in Uganda? It isn't. Is the government ready to accept and say, oh, look here, we did this, but we are at fault. The internet shut down during the election. Is the government willing to accept these things? Or will they say, okay, we are in power and there is nothing you can do about it. We can shoot you and we can kill you. So if these people can't accept these things, let's say a Truth and Reconciliation Commission is formed and they ask these hard questions and they get these people, will they comply with whatever the commission has come with? That takes us back to the transition that we need as a nation. For healing to go on in the nation, people need to accept their faults. That look here, well, we have governed well, but there are these mistakes we made, and we are sorry. And for us Africans, sorry. I think it, it's in our culture. They, they, people tend to think that when you say you're sorry, you're weak. 
I saw it with Theresa May uh, when she was still prime minister. She came out and said, I'm sorry eh, to the public. So it, it, it's not bad to acknowledge one's fault. And uh, this is an opportunity for all of us to call upon this government. And maybe people that belong to the governments before it that uh, committed injustices. Uh, my colleagues have talked about the Idi Amin government and what have you. There is need to come out and say, look, we did this. We are sorry. How are we moving forward? How shall we establish a commission that is independent, that will look into these matters and ask those hard questions? We need people who will ask those hard questions, not people who will dilly-dally with the people who committed the atrocities. So there is need for a transition. There is need to seek for the truth and justice. And many people know the truth, but they do not want to accept it. There is need to recognize that, yes, we are at fault. Eh? And then we say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. We are at fault and we are indeed sorry. And then we can move forward. But like uh, Council Mitala said, you see, you don't make faults and you think we shall be like the Catholic Church. And we say, okay, now say one Hail Mary and go. For the society to learn, there should be a penalty for these people. Eh? You do not kill 20 people or 400 people. And, and you, you think, of course, the Catholic Church will forgive you and you will say one Hail Mary and go. But then for people to realize that there is justice, there should be a penalty. So that those who will come after you will know that it is wrong to abduct people, that it is wrong to use a gift that was given to us by Vint Saf when he formed TCPIP as a free gift, the internet. I, I got an award in Los Angeles for using the internet to, to help people from the internet society, the body that gave us internet. Vint Saf gave the internet as, as a free gift. And then you come and say you're going to levy taxes on it. You, you're going to shut it down. You, there is a need for acceptance that the faults are there. They should seek penance, not in the Catholic Church alone, but also among the people. And then they should serve their sentence. Thank right. you. When we come back in a minute, we are going to examine whether uh, acceptance of wrongdoing uh, will actually... We, if, if people in power reach an extent where they are willing to accept wrongdoing, is the public ready to forgive them when we come back? This is the state of the nation. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Salvo. Of course, these conversations happen happen at 7 p.m. Kampala. Uh, I have taken long editing that uh, promo. Nayenga uh, mutugobele ku Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Please follow, uh, like, and uh, share. Share widely so that uh, more Ugandans can engage in this conversation and try to uh, see how we can uh, come up uh, with solutions to better our uh, country. Mr. Mitala, uh, if I am the one in power and come to you acknowledging the wrongdoing that I have uh, that, 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 that I have orchestrated in the past, are you, the public, ready to forgive me? Um, 
you see what what I've, what I've intended to do here tonight is I wanted to give um, uh, two scenarios uh, one to make the case for prosecution as the best way towards resolving uh, these uh, post conflict you know uh, problems or post conflict troubles and uh, bringing these into the truth and reconciliation commission we're talking about here but also talk about on the other hand also talk about the the uh, give or make the argument for actually you know going for the reconciliation processes if so we should so my starting point is that the best the best way to deal with this matter is to consider the court system the prosecutorial system and make sure that you know, those who have perpetrated crimes against the, uh, the citizens they they are appropriately dealt with within the confines of the law there is uh, a popular feeling that uh, you know truth and reconciliation commissions or fact finding missions they are they, they they are suitable for states that are dysfunctional for failing states the states that are coming out of conflict and therefore they lack the capacity to be able to address you know these sorts of problems and in this regard we are taking into account that when you are emerging from a war or when you, when you are emerging from a, a very bad dictatorial kind of arrangement there are certain uh, institutions of state that are not functional uh, one of those is obviously going to be the court because the reason people go to court is that they hope that those who have you know committed crimes they will be punished there will be compensation, there will be retribution, and there will be deterrence, you know, along those lines. But in some respects, there could be a good reason for wanting to avoid, you know, the 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 the, the, the formal prosecution kind of you know arrangement and go for uh, truth commissions as the best way of resolving these issues. And uh, one of these one of the cases, one of the points that I'm pointing out here is that the lack of uh, the preparedness by states, you know. Uh, to be able to effectively prosecute because in order for us to have a, a, an effective prosecution and uh, you know avoid you know inconclusiveness of processes where you go to court and cases fail because for lack of evidence or because uh, the process has been fast, uh, frustrated by those in power because they are very connected or they know the judges or the judges are impartial and that kind of things in order to avoid that kind of situation you might find yourself that there is good reason maybe for practical reasons or for policy arrangements to make sure that you know, we are recommending a, a, a truth commission as a, as a way of resolving these sorts of problems um, but you see even in that regard you know i think i really i want to to, to post to, to to reposit myself on the other side that really makes or has the view i have the firm view that uh, you know these these informal kind of arrangements they they destabilize even the transitional arrangements we have because as i've already stated in my case you it's very difficult to to create a scenario where you know in our in, in our car because i don't want to even i don't want to look in any other situation there they are examples that can be given for instance when you talk about uh, you know the, the German, the prosecution of the Nazi for the Nuremberg, you know, crimes. The Nazi had been defeated completely. You know, their state was disarray. And basically, they were running away. They were, it, it was easy to pick them up. It was easy to identify them and, you know, bang them in court and it, uh, crimes had been properly recorded. It was easy, you know, to amass that kind of evidence and be able to use them. But, uh, in our situations, it may not be the same because, you know, people have been in state, they have been in, at, at the home of government, either directly or through their agents, and they influence, they've got a very, you know, heavy influence on, on, on our processes. That This is why we're asking the question that who would be on these commissions? I mean, in our Uganda, and I'm sorry for being a cynical or a skeptic, actually, in that respect. We've seen so many situations where honorable people, you know, people that you have high regard for, you know, people that you have high regard for, people you want to look up to and say, I think this gentleman, if he speaks, I can be persuaded, I can go with them. And then they are swept under the carpet. 
So what confidence does the public, can the public get from scenarios of such a kind where, say, suppose Mr. XY is appointed to be the chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Uganda, and then the next day is hobnobbing with people who have been accused of these very crimes against the people. I mean, where do you expect the public to get, you know, the confidence that the people who are carrying out these exercises are carrying out these exercises in their name? I mean, for me, I can only ask questions. I don't have the answers, but I want people to be <laughs> to, to, to be intrinsic and be able to look on the other side of things and put things in context, you know, because that's the point that I'm making, that these processes that we are chatting about here, it's very nice to come and discuss the law and paint it and, uh, you know, come up with all these beautiful recommendations as truth, truth and, you know, reconciliation commissions always do. They publish reports, very heavy reports. Some of them never get to see that day of the light. We have an example, our own 1986 situation. Ask how many Ugandans, even people who are well, well familiar with things, ask them how many of them have seen the text of the, the Uganda Truth and Reconciliation Commission of 1980s that was conducted by Justice, the late Justice Odell. How many Ugandans have seen that report? I understand and I've read this, it's on record. People have done research about it, that, uh, you know, the report was published. There was even, there were even pamphlets that were created, that were supposed to be, you know, cascaded or transmitted within the general public so that the consciousness of the nation you know, that we, the people, according to the preamble of our constitution, saying that we must never go back to this because we accept and we acknowledge that there were excesses within that period that were unjustifiable, you know. It's the preamble of our constitution. And on the basis of that, the commission was set up and it published a report. And, you know, that report never saw the day of the light. So where is the confidence today that... Uh, you know that uh, we, we we are going to be able to navigate that 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 that, that problem there. So for me, I, I do I do have uh, concerns, you know, to that extent. But uh, is there a case for truth and reconciliation commissions? Of course, there is. You know, especially if the public is anchoring for it, if the public is demanding for it. As I, as I said before, you know, uh, the 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 role, the voice of the masses in these sorts of things is the most central you know, kind of what that we've got to be listening to. So if the people are saying that we need to sit down and have a national conversation, but the trouble is that this has not been tested. Has it been put to a referendum? Has there been, a, you know, a, a, a research that has indicated that there is, the, this is what the public is asking for? We are, all, we are just only hearing, you know, voices, random voices from here and there, whether for people who are looking for, you know, their own political agendas or for whatever reason, you know, the, 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 the parameters of having this conversation are not clear. They have not been set out properly so that to be able to set a clear agenda and say, OK, we do accept that there is a problem. There has been a problem since 1962. We have endured through this problem. Constitutions have been changed. You know, constitutions have been made. Governments have been changed you know, by force. You know, there has been atrocities, there has been mass murders, there has been arbitrary detentions. They are, you know, we have got to acknowledge that. And if we do not acknowledge that, then having this conversation is pretty, it's pretty academic, to be honest. Um, right, right, so, right. So, you know... In one minute. Yeah, that, that that is my that is my feeling that uh, you know these uh, these exercises they tend to be ineffective in in as far as resolving you know the challenges that they are set out to resolve and i have to say again that there are very few cases and i make the example that even the south african because the south african is the best example we have closer to home you know it was broad it was sweeping it had uh, popular support across all areas. But even that one, the best example we can cite closer to home, it actually did not resolve the South African problem. So again, that leads me back to my conclusion that I think we need to consider dealing with these matters in a prosecutory way that, you know, so this is the only way we can get this impunity out of the way because people have got to be made to understand that when you occupy office, 
you are a custodian, you are a trustee, you are carrying out executive functions as a trustee on behalf of the people. If you exceed your responsibilities, if you exceed your power and mandate, you are committing a crime, and therefore that crime can be prosecuted. That is the only deterrence we can have in order to be able to forge forward. And this, that is my view in as far as this is concerned. Right, right. You cited the South African as the uh, closest example. Of course, there, there was also the Kenyan one. Uh, but as uh, you rightly say, that the South African one was uh, more broadly followed and uh, uh, had uh, uh, a lot uh, for us to learn from, even though uh, the perpetrators seem to have been uh, mostly U U European, South Africans, European South Africans. Uh, Sayun, you, 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 you cited DP as one of the organizations that uh, establishes truth and justice. Of course, uh, the, 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 the slogan is truth and justice. Uh, and now you, you are very closely working with the, the current government. Uh, your president, Jeno, is the minister of justice. Uh, do you think uh, your president, Jeno, has the capacity uh, to establish such a conversation, uh, given what is going on right now? And uh, uh, can people trust uh, the DP, for example, in establishing such an entity of truth and reconciliation? Thank you so much, Tony. Um... To start with, uh, Council Michara also needs truth and reconciliation alone because he's doubting too much. I, <laughs> I don't know why he's doubting so much. But, uh, well, to start with, uh, one thing I want to tell you is that you can, not all dreams are not right. You, when the day you dream of urinating on bed, you will urinate there. So the whole thing is, uh, to start with, you know, Democratic Party has been all along championing for this, that why can't we sit and talk as a country? You talk of hobnobbing with, 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 this, with the regime, but then how are you going to get to talk some, to someone you're not talking to? Dialogue, it, it is all going to start with dialogue. We need to accept that we can sit on a round table and dialogue and agree that this and this happened. You realize DP is a pre-independence party, and we contributed a lot towards the liberation and independence of this country, by the way. So we understand and we know how to shape this country with the experience of how we've been here longer. So the best thing we can do is trust, is have the trust within ourselves first. The problem that we're having as Ugandans is that we don't even have the trust. We don't even want to try something. We, we just want to sit back and, and, and start lamenting and, and believe that things will work themselves out. No. Until you try it, then it won't work out. So DP has taken a step to, 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 to step forward and see whether this can work out. Because until we try it, then we cannot do it. Then the best thing now we need is to support on the ground. Now that has gotten there, something can be done. Let, let us not just be negative from the start. Because I believe that with, when you have the space and you have the zeal, all you need now is support for the people that have sober minds, you know, and can guide. Because this is a government that is, is, is almost it's at the helm. I am looking at, at this government is, is, is almost somewhere where there is a little bit of confusion. You look at people are talking of Mohod's project, and then there are also these opposition political parties that also have capacities to lead. And then there is also some emerging leader somewhere whom maybe we've not seen, but we emerge and become a leader in the future there. So we need to reconcile all of these ones. So what we need now is a bridge. Someone can, that can bridge all these people and sit them down and say this is where the country can go. Otherwise, if we continue having people saying you cannot join this government and then there are those that are saying we cannot even come closer to the junta, there are those that are already throwing stones at Honorable Mao for, for, 
for stepping in to be in the ministry of justice. But then, if, if at all we are not there to do it, then who is going to do it for us? If we keep all shying away and saying that, you know, you cannot work with this government. Because I believe, though, this is an appointment that comes from the president of the country, of whom I believe most of the people are grieved with. It's an appointment with him. But then what if you go with your sober mind? Does that mean that when President Museveni appoints you, then your brain becomes brainwashed? I do not really think and I don't believe in that. So I believe that the best thing now we can do is to give support to Democratic Party as a whole, not only uh, to Honorable Mao, give them the necessary support so that we can give them ideas on, on what can be done and also step forward where there is need and help this to work out. Otherwise, uh, we are into a time where we need all of us to realize the truth and have trust. Because the first thing that I'm, uh, I'm looking at is it seems there is a breakage of trust where trust no longer, no longer exists within ourselves. That every time we look at someone now, we are looking at someone who is going to government to eat, we are looking at someone who is going to join government to commit atrocities, to, to help the government to do inequality, to help in moving injustices. But then we need to work on our mindset. In, in, in our campaign, we were telling you, Ghana, that we have, we have among the problems that we have here is fear among Ugandans. Right. Are you done? And so, and so these are the things that we need to work on as, as quickly as we can and as possible. Right, right. Well, well, you, you continue to make a case for, 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 for your president general, which I truly appreciate. I think loyalty is very important within our political realms. Uh, uh, I haven't read... Uh, 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 Mr. Honorable Mao's uh, priorities, 10 priorities or five priorities or three priorities. I don't know what his priorities are uh, as, uh, as Minister of Justice. Uh, so I have no uh, yardstick for, uh, for, 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 for evaluating him. Uh, but I've also seen some uh, social media sentiments alluding to the notion that uh, he said that uh, uh, President can be uh, chosen by uh, parliamentarians or can be chosen in, in, in parliament. I'm not sure, I'm not completely sure how true that sentiment is. I'm, I don't know if he actually said it, uh, but like I said, we cannot uh, evaluate Mao without necessarily uh, knowing what his priorities are, even when uh, we would like to have a dialogue I, I guess I'm going to leave that to 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 to, to Mr. Mota and uh, uh, Mr. Mitella to respond. Uh, do, do you guys think? Do you guys think that we have an opportunity in Mao uh, before, to start be, this dialogue? Be, before before you jump ahead, and just allow me to make very very quick six points. I'm just going to read them very quickly because I've said that you know the best approach to resolve this problem would be to go down the route of prosecuting the perpetrators of human rights abuses, you know. But uh, I just want to set out just a couple of very quick things, you know, the grounds that would make a truth and, you know, reconciliation arrangement work effectively. And I'm just going to quickly, you know, reference them by way of bullet points. Number one, where there is lack of resources and preparedness, you know, to effectively prosecute, you know. So we are talking about weak judicial systems uh, whose benefit would only work, you know, to uh, frustrate the dima or just uh, you know facilitate the demise of our democracy lack of uh, popular mandate you know this always happens where we are in some form of a power sharing arrangement because way that means you are pulling um, separate groups from left right and center where it may not be very easy you know to form consensus on how to forge the way ahead and therefore you know it brings about that means that compromises have got to be made on either side, which compromises might not be very effective in facilitating, you know, uh, truth and reconciliation. Uh, secondly, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, weak court systems. You, 
these kind of scenarios happen a lot where we have military kind of courts that tell you use we have a scenario where in our own situation we have a military course court that has got the um, the, the, the the remit of trying civilians in military courts for cases that they shouldn't be there it's a it's, it's a sign of weakness within our systems because what it does is that it it, it delegitimizes the the prosecutory you know space for, for for these sort of things to be to be dealt with so in that case where we have a scenario like that then you might make the case that the truth and reconciliation might be the best way forward you know uh secondly uh or lastly uh it is impossible usually it's impossible to prosecute all human rights abuses and excesses it's practically impossible because to do that that means you love to you have to set to, to separate them in different categories and decide that only those that reach a certain threshold can be prosecuted effectively what that means is that those that do not meet the threshold for prosecution they don't matter and that leaves people the leeway not to behave as they wish and this is what you know you know brings about this so-called impunity because people can pick you up in a drone nobody knows where you are it's not big enough nobody has died even though a few people have been kicked about but it's not really that important therefore that's not very significant so we can look away from that so that kind of uh, separating and uh, that kind of separation of uh, you know those different aspects kind of creates maybe a desirable you know space for a truth and reconciliation kind of exercise to take place because what that means is that those who are afflicted and they are not able to seek justice from the courts of law or other mechanism then they can come forward we can talk about our experiences in our own voices we can have a record and that record if it's done transparently it can possibly be able to facilitate you know our democracy and uh, make us a better people so those are just observations i just wanted to add on to why maybe a reconciliation exercise might be you know necessary in some in some regards mr mota your thoughts after having had all these uh, insights from uh, our sister Helen and uh, Mr. Mittal, of course, uh, re-establishing what uh, uh, could bring about a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that works. Your thoughts, Mr. Mota? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Henry. Uh, Helen has uh, talked about how they, as, as DP, the party to treat it be much of a judge of it that is hinged on truth and justice uh, so for them they have elected to to join I, I hope i'm putting it right to join the nrm government in a bid to seek truth and justice i, I think uh mr nobat mao is, is a very brilliant person studied at Yale he's a lawyer he's very brilliant but for me I believe DP accepting a ministry say of justice is it really helpful to the ordinary Ugandan or is it helpful mostly to the big wigs in the Democratic Party say Nobat Mao, who is now a minister, Hassan uh, Bide, or the big wigs, as an ordinary Ugandan who is seeking for justice, do we really get the justice when uh, Mr. Museveni gives Mr. Nobat Mao a ministry? I think that uh, by joining them, Mr. Norbert Mao makes it look like they were they are genuine people. They have served well. That is why he's willing to go and serve with them. I think we need to have candid conversations. We need to ask the questions that people do not want to, to, to hear, but they are the questions that will bring out the truth. A lot of atrocities have been committed. There is need for justice. The truth is known to everyone. We all know it. 
and they also know it. How are we getting justice? We're not getting justice through joining them. No. We are getting justice through standing still, like Rohlila, Madiba, did for over 27 years in jail until they said no more appetite. He would have joined them midway, maybe after 10 years or 15 years, but he said no. If it needs to be jailed for life, it's okay, as long as appetite comes to an end. So joining them for me is, is really not the best thing. The best thing is every Ugandan, not to look at maybe Dr. VCJ or to look at Bobby Wine for justice. We need to look for justice ourselves, each one of us. We need to stand and say, no, this is unjust. This is unfair. And we need a system that runs for the people, a system that defends the people. We need an end to the oppression. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mot. I'm going to give uh, my sister uh, Sayun an opportunity to respond to that before we go into our final remarks. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. So uh, please, Sayun, respond to that. And then uh, you, you can, after rest your response, you can tell us how you think uh, we can actually implement this conversation uh, from uh, an academic dialogue to 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 something practical, something more practical. How do we uh, bring in more stakeholders to engage in this conversation and actually be interested in actually establishing such an entity if it must be uh, established for, 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 for a better Uganda, uh, for a future Uganda now? Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, 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 Sadi. Uh, to be able to respond to Brazil, what DP did is not at the badger, not at the lion, and it is just an agreement. And we just cooperate on a few things. We didn't join NRM. We know where to DP knows where to join NRM from. We actually know where the offices are. And you know, every party has its text on how you join it. You don't just wake up and sign an agreement and then you join it must have a party card and all that. There are a lot of stakes on how you join up another political party. But for us as DP, we have always been pro-people. I We do not believe that sitting aside and then watching this government do a lot of crushing and, 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 and uh, we are not taking part in reshaping what we call this country can work. And that is why I insist that it is high time that we agreed that we must talk. Because maybe for starters, we have to agree that we have participated in elections right from, from, from 2000 and what. We've been participating in elections, hoping that this government can, can, can get out of the way. But it is not. We've gone for violence, actually, gone an extra mile of joining NRM in, in its own game. Because NRM is the massacre of violence. We've joined this. It has not worked. What remains here for us now, it is sitting together and agreeing that actually we can work here. Every political party has had, or oh, someone maybe was intended to leave this country. Maybe you've had a manifesto. How about you sat down and said, it has not worked, but then this is where I want this country. You throw it in the, in the face of these people and see whether they can actually implement it. But then if you wish to lead this country and then you get your whole manifesto and all your dreams and all your, your good thoughts about how this country can work, and then you put them in your pocket and you decide that you will sit, let's say, at City House where our offices are with them, you've not even helped, then that means you're not helping this country. Because for us, we... Some people want to believe that not, 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 not dialoguing with maybe Museveni or people in government is, is, is maybe giving Museveni a headache. It does not. It actually 
suppresses and and it 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 hurts the people to whom we wish to to work with because to get there we want to work for the people not for this government and i want to categorically state that we are honorable mao and dp signed this agreement for ugandans and not for the ruling government for us we are pro people and we want to work for this government um and maybe on how this 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 agreement can work is and on how this uh, recruit and reconciliation, the dialogue, all that we are looking for, how can it work? We all have good ideas. How about we continue engaging and we engage people who we know can get us there instead of sitting back forth and then, and then we watch these, these things being done in wrong ways. We, we, ca we, ha we have a stake in this country, you people. This country is ours. Sitting back and leaving it to these people and we tell them, take it where you want it to go. No, we must, we have a voice, we can speak against it. And we actually have a stake that you can be given a ministry, you can be given what, and then you get there and perform and work for Ugandans. That is all I can call you for and that is all I have for this evening. Thank you so much, Sadi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sayun, uh, for, for that contribution. Mr. Mittal, how do, how do we wrap up this conversation? Be, be, before, uh, Mr. Be, before Mr. Mittal, allow right. me just one minute. Right, right. So my sister Helen uh, is talking of a scenario of a man who has a wife, okay, a girlfriend, two girlfriends, one formal and the other is a side dish. So he gives the one that he loves a ring engagement ring and when the other complains she's like he's like no 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 it, it is just an engagement ring you know you're the one i love so that is that <laughs> <that's laughs> my sister Helen is explaining so mr mao is, is is dining with mr Museveni and he's telling us no 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 don't worry i'm doing this on behalf of, of you the people and and i want to save you from this injustice okay? Right. <laughs> well, Mr. Vitala, you have had uh, the, the comparisons, the scenarios, uh, and of course, Helen has laughed it off. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, do you think uh, the cooperation, Mr. Vitala, I mean, uh, Mr. Mao calls it the cooperation. Uh, the cooperation doesn't want to call it uh, uh, an alliance or uh, a joining of the NRM. He calls it a cooperation. And uh, uh, but I think we also have to actually interrogate how are we going to have this Truth and Reconciliation Commission if we are struggling to speak uh, with the people who we think are powerful and uh, could potentially be the ones who set up the, that kind of entity. I think that's another legitimate question. And of course, I know I have two lawyers uh, in the house who are also always very good at asking questions uh, uh, and uh, letting people figure out uh, what, what the right uh, way forward is. <laughs> but Mr. Vitella, let us um, wrap up this on, conversation. On, 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 the, on the cooperation between the DP and the NRM, you know, I'm not a member, well, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a card holding member of the DP, although I'm sympathetic, you know, in some respects. I have to say that uh, I am disappointed with uh, Mr. Mao in, in quite so many, you know, forums uh, for the things that uh, he could he for the things that he actually exposes and the way he's handled some of those things I think uh, and I say this very painfully because uh, I, I I admire the man you know I remember him on capital gang I remember him when I was a young university law student you know people that you looked up to uh, he's uh, a great speaker and I think he's got everything that can uh, enable him to be president of the country and possibly be even a very good president. But I'm disappointed on a number of occasions. Number one, his, his use of language uh, against uh, adversaries is, is really not very good. I've heard him refer to people as a mommy. Uh, I think that's disrespectful of him. Uh, but all, on particularly on this uh, cooperation thing, um, it's troubling for me because and I'll try to look at it very quickly in this perspective. Say if you have a company, because political parties work like companies, you know, they've got shareholders, 
and they've got uh, board directors and so on and so forth. I think uh, a director of a company or the or the management committee cannot, in its entire in, in in its entirety, substantially you know alter the the constitution of of, of a company without consulting the shareholders. That's a basic principle of, law, of company law. I think that uh, that's how political parties operate. From what I understood, uh, Mr. Mao, together with uh, his working committee, they came up with an arrangement where the shareholders of the company were not consulted, and the party constitution in brackets was uh, effectively, uh, you know, changed to a very key and substantive, you know, element of the party structure or its objective or something, you know, along those lines seems to have been compromised without uh, having a consultation with the other party members. I think I find that very problematic. In a normal sense of things, I don't think it would pass the test of legitimacy, to be very honest. But that's how I feel about that. Uh, I say that I am very, very, I, I, I admire Mr. Mao very much. So I hope when he sees me speaking like this, he won't be disappointed. But, uh, you know, we have to say that we have to state the facts as they are, or at least how we perceive them. And I think perhaps he needs to be given an opportunity so that he can explain himself properly of what his objective, what his agenda is, so that maybe people can best understand him. <clears throat> I think that's what I could say on that, by and large. In regards to what we've been talking about, you know, the, 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 the key thing that we need to be conscious of is the aspect of acknowledgement, you know, the admission that something is true as stated, you know, or something that so so that so that the claims you know can have some authority you need to acknowledge that there is a problem if we are not acknowledge, acknowledging that there is a problem in our social coherency in our in, in, in ourselves as ugandans because there is a problem there you know i i can see the tension and i can sense the tension and i think everybody senses this this, this tension obviously if uh, having some kind of meaningful conversation can help us to resolve that problem, you know, it's, it's a welcome measure, you know. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, there needs to be some kind of mechanism that we have to use to be able to, 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 to chat, you know, a better way forward. The only challenge we have is that we have been there, we have precedents, and we know why those precedents failed in the first place. Maybe we could learn lessons from there and say to us that in the first instance we failed, we're not going to make the same mistakes again. Let's try it one other time and see if it can deliver us to the promised land. That's That That would be my observation for today. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitala, for those insights. Uh, Mr. Mota, well, and of course you're wrapping up on this conversation. Uh, your thoughts uh, and how to proceed uh, when you are done, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Yun to, to wrap up this conversation, but also uh, it would be interesting to hear from you guys, uh, you folks, who are some of the other stakeholders that we should invite in having this conversation and how should we uh, continue to elevate it or progress this conversation? Because I think it's an important conversation. Uh, we There's a culture in Uganda of talking about things and then uh, sweeping them under the rug. How do we not... Uh, sweep this under the rug and, uh, and actually get something done out of it. Mr. Mota. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Henry, for this opportunity, for this platform. We need more of this. And uh, it helps bring people up to speed with, with what's happening. Like I said before, there is need for a transition there is need for a transition. We have had uh, enough. There is need to bring justice to people. Uh, we need to do more action. Not, of course, these these forums are good. Uh, such fora are good, and uh, talking about this is good. But we need action. We need to hit the roads. We need to do something uh, about the the injustices that are inflicted on us and, and the people. It's good that uh, such platforms have come up and thank you, Henry, for this initiative. It helps enlighten the people 
so that people get to know these things. Certain people don't even know that uh, there have been truth and, uh, and justice commissions before elsewhere in the world. They don't know if it's possible in Uganda. So to bring such ideas is good. I want to end by calling upon all Ugandans. Do not look at your leaders for justice. Look at yourself. Start with yourself. Start with the family. Start with the community. It is these small numbers of people that will come up together and form a voice that no one can stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mota. Uh, Sister Sayun, your thoughts? Uh, of course, uh, we, did, we did not intend to put DP uh, on, on the stand. Uh, it, 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 it just ended up being there by default, I guess. Uh, but what are your thoughts as you wrap up? And uh, do you think you can get a smile on this platform, uh, Honorable Minister Mao? so that he can uh, uh, give us some insights on, uh, well, first of all, we don't know what his priorities are or his agenda as, as, as Minister of Justice. Uh, and to explain better what that so-called cooperation uh, means for Ugandans uh, now and in the future. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Your voice is very low. I will share with you the probably the draft of our 2021 uh, elections manifesto, to which you will find that uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission part of. That means we didn't dream of it yesterday. I can ably also share for 20, for 2016, 11 around if I happen to find it still in my documentation because. I just lost my phone of recent. I don't know whether I can recover that. But the fact is that this Uganda belongs to all of us. This Uganda is me. This Uganda is you, Sally, and this Uganda is Utara. So mm. we have stakes in this country, and we must talk about where we want it to go. We want religious leaders on board. We should have cultural leaders on board. Political leaders, of course, you cannot avoid politics in any way. That's how the Democratic Party ended here, where it was not supposed to be talked about. So we shall lead also political leaders. And actually, not all political leaders, sober political leaders. Sober. I want to say it again. Sober. People who know where this country wants to go. We need to sit as generations, aggrieved generations. All generations have different issues. All generations should talk about this. We have three almost generations, and every generation seems it is their time. So what are we going to do about it? Every generation has done all it takes. Every generation sees that it can get there. So how are we going to avoid that? We are talking of transition. But I was talk as we talk of transition, and uh, maybe Muhozi, maybe Honorable Mao, maybe Bobby White, maybe Bessie is preparing. There is also a Helen seated here. I think you can make it there. So all that is what actually should steer us very fast and make us think of how we need this country to learn. And we can only run this country properly if we sit down, dialogue, and draw a map and draw lines on how we want to get there. I um, right. We can get Honorable Mao anytime, any day, and get his time to address his, he's a very fine gentleman, you know, so you can get him. I will make sure I, I draw for you the channel on which you can get him so that he can come and you hear him yourself also. I want to thank you so much and wish you a very nice evening and morning and afternoon to all the time people. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Helen, uh, for those insights. Uh, the Honorable Mao was accessible before he became minister. I'm not sure he's, uh, he's accessible anymore. Uh, we used In to fact, have him on that. Uh... <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to give you a task. <laughs> I am going to give you a task to get him back 
uh, to the state of the nation. I know it has been uh, on uh, several Twitter spaces, uh, but perhaps people would be more interested in seeing his face uh, and learning what uh, his agenda is as Minister of Justice. Uh, uh, I thought one of his uh, uh, very primary priorities would be to uh, free all political prisoners. He hasn't done so yet. Uh, probably he's still working on his priorities. Uh, but we are counting down his 100 days uh, as we do uh, for all leaders. Uh, and we hope uh, that within... Uh, uh, the 100 days he will have done something that shows uh, that this is indeed just a cooperation and, and not uh, a marriage uh, to 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 nr uh, to and nr to nrm uh it's been a pleasure hosting uh, you folks uh we always enjoy having these conversations but we need to to remove these conversations from the realm of academic uh, dialogues to, 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 to the streets of Kampala, to the practicalities uh, where they affect people on the ground, where they affect people uh, uh, on their dining tables uh, for those uh, who have them and actually can do have the privilege to have dining tables. And uh, uh, I'm using that metaphor, but uh, when I say dining tables, I mean where people have their lunches and uh, have those conversations uh, while they are with each other. Uh, how do we remove this conversation from the academic realm to those people on the ground? Again, it's been a pleasure hosting you. My name is Henry Sully. This is the State of the Nation. Uh, please let me know uh, what uh, who, who are some of the other stakeholders I should engage in this conversation. Uh, and if you really, if you do want to come back uh, and uh, interrogate some of the other issues that are happening in Uganda, I know uh, I momentarily brought in the, the issue of the com computer misuse bill. Uh, it is something we need to interrogate. How, who, is, who is it going to affect and uh, uh, how should Ugandans uh, approach that bill uh, before it, has, it, it, is, it, it becomes effective? These are all conversations that we should engage with. Uh, and I hope you can uh, take this week to think about some of the topics that uh, you think are important and that we should talk about uh, in the coming weeks. Again, my name is Henry Sully, and this is the State of the Nation. This is the State of the Nation. Rifa Mwanga. We are deliberate, we are reasonable, we are uncensored. The state of the nation with Henry Salvador.